things aren't as bad as I feared. As a matter of fact, they're pretty good. It's been months since my visit to the hospital and saying my first words, and there have been a lot of changes. The first, admittedly, was kind of hard to swallow, and that was Blue Blood and I being put in separate rooms as soon as we got home. I had feared that perhaps whatever was wrong with me was putting my brother at risk, that maybe I had some kind of contagious disease, but my parents never stopped visiting me or holding me, so I began to second guess that conclusion. Later, I started to notice two other changes in my life, and those were that nobody used magic around me, and I hardly ever had headaches. The connection had been made until one day when Blue Blood came barging into my room, spotted me in my crib, and actually levitated me through the air to him so they could squeeze me in a hug. I returned their brace, ignoring the pain and mumbling his name. When I felt tears on my shoulder and heard what must have been an attempt at my own, I squeezed him tighter. I didn't realize how much I missed him until he was in my hooves again. Mom and Dad barged in soon after and had to pry blue blood off of me, but neither one of us made it easy on the adults as we clung to each other. It wasn't until my brother's horn lit up right next to mine that I released him with a cry, clinging to my throbbing skull. After that, Dad scooped up a wide-eyed blue blood and made a hasty retreat while Mom began rocking me back and forth. Though short, the whole deal was exhausting and I fell asleep. It was later that night, after I had been woken up with nothing to do but stare at the ceiling, that I pondered the day's events and began to figure things out. Though I didn't know what it was at the time, I realized that the force unicorns used to perform their impossible feats must have been the source of my suffering, and the pieces began to come together. I was able to learn more of my situation later thanks to another change in my routine life. Having spoken a full sentence, even if it was mostly regurgitating something I've heard said to me in Blue Blood countless times before, marked me as a prodigy in the eyes of my parents. I had wanted to avoid such an outcome as I hardly deserved such a title, but I cannot argue with the benefits as afforded me. Practically from the moment we returned, there has been an adult trying to get me to repeat their words, and with damage already done from my spur of the moment speech, I obliged them. While this has gotten me more than a few queer looks from some of the house's staff, there have been others who have gladly jumped on the bandwagon. Most of the diligent of my impromptu teachers, though, has been my mother. She actually goes through the effort of holding up the object she's naming and miming the verb she's teaching me. Thanks to her, my vocabulary has practically exploded overnight, and I find myself practicing with every free moment to try to remember even a fraction of what she's cramming into my noggin. It was during one of her lessons that I learned the name of a unicorn's power. The pink mare was as enthusiastic as ever she got me to say new words, releasing a thrilled squee whenever she succeeded. It was with eagerness that she searched the room for another object to name, her eyes landing on the pillow in my crib before attempting to float it over to us. As soon as her horn began to glow, I winced ever so slightly and she froze. The light gone from her horn, she cradled me and apologized before the pillow even hit the bed. Okay, mommy. I told her, rubbing my temple. I'm so sorry, Pure. I forgot. Mommy won't do it again. She said in response, placing me back on the playmat. She tilted my head back to look at me. Maybe we should make a break from practice, hmm? Do you want to look at one of your picture books? Okay, I reaffirmed. Keep learning. My determined face was apparently more comical than I would have liked because Mom burst into giggles, hoof rising to her lips. <laughs> Okay, okay, what should we learn next, my little scholar? Though I could tell the question was more to herself than me, I couldn't help but ask, What's that? What's what, sweetie? She said, looking around the room. Scrunching up my face, I thought hard on how to get across what I meant. What's that? What's light? As I poked my own horn and then pointed at hers, her eyes lit up in recognition before a small frown pulled at her lips. That's... the light is mommy's magic, sweetie. Magic? I tried the word, rolling it around in my mouth. What's... magic? Oh, it's very... complicated. She said, obviously struggling as I tried to help. Magic makes stuff fly? It can, she answered after a moment. Blue blood do more magic than fly. Yes, your brother does more with magic than makes stuff fly. Magic can do very much, sweetie. I tilted my head at that. Magic hurt ponies. 
No, magic should not hurt ponies. But magic hurt me. Her entire body sagged at this. Yes, magic does hurt you. That was all I needed to prove my hypothesis true, but it didn't make me feel better. So I was different, wrong, and a burden. Even though I had thought as much until then, this confirmation still hurt. But I tried to grab hold of what optimism I could. I was alive, and hoped it would remain that way for the seeable future. Maybe it wasn't even that bad a condition to have. I didn't know everything, but decided for the time not to push the subject. My vocabulary wasn't nearly expansive enough to delve into that conversation, and it seemed the topic wasn't one mom was comfortable discussing with her baby. So when she tried to change the subject with a new word, I didn't fight it. I would come to learn everything I needed to know about the condition eventually. It was something parents couldn't keep from their sick children, no matter how hard they wanted to. Hey there, sweetie. There's some pony here to see you. My mother calls, pulling me from my memories, turning from the tea party I was having with some stuffed animals, something I <laughs> shamefully admit to doing sometimes when alone. I see my mom standing by the door with a big grin on her face. A second later, I see a little white muzzle peeking around the corner between her legs before a pristine blur tackle me to the floor. Blue blood! I shout in surprise, hugging the giggling foal back. The colt lays a sloppy kiss to my cheek, blowing bubbles and tickling me, before hopping to his hoofs and darting back a few paces. Climbing less gracefully to my own hoofs, I can't stop grinning when I realize what my brother is playing at. That he's more agile to me, that he can use magic in ways that I hardly fathom, that doing so would be a literal pain, none of that mattered as I scraped my hoof across the ground and charged. I was going to wrangle me a little pony today. Ornate watched with a soft smile as her foals ran around the room without a care in the world. Blue blood surges have started settling down recently, and she felt it safe for them to spend more time together. Celestia knew her little style and needed it. Ever since the incident nearly three months ago, Blue Blood had been suffering bouts of depression when he would cry for hours and refuse any care or comfort. It broke both parents' hearts to see the cult so inconsolable, especially when the reason for it was both obvious and undoable. There was no doubt that little Blue Blood missed his sister terribly, but they just couldn't afford to let him near her while his magic was so volatile. Now though, the two frolicked about the room as if they didn't have a care in the world. Pure Blood tripped, landing hard on her chin and ornate made to move to her side before Blue Blood skidded to a stop and whirled around as his sister tried to pick herself up. His horn sparked, the lily filly fell once again with a wince, and the light immediately extinguished itself. An instant feeling of pride washed over the ornate garden as she watched her son march over and nudge his sister into a seated position. Pure, for her part, looked like she could use the break, as she had flushed cheeks and was panting slightly. Perhaps Ornate was focusing too much on the little filly's learning and not enough on letting her get fresh air and exercise. Thinking about it, Ornate has been treating her daughter like she was made of glass ever since the hospital. Blue Blood had been taken out to her gardens to play plenty of times by his father when he wasn't throwing a tantrum for his missing sibling. Perhaps Pure would enjoy the son too. How are they doing? A deep voice whispered behind her, causing the mare to jump slightly. Don't sneak up on me like that, reprimanded Ornate as she swatted her husband on the shoulder. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to scare you, he apologized with a chuckle, stepping closer to look into the room. What he saw warmed his heart. His son, staring at his winded sister in concern, looking around the room a moment before spotting one of her books with a grin. Dashing over to it, the colt was back at his sister's side in an instant to plop the book down and babble as he pointed at it. He wanted pure blood to look through the book with him. They're so precious together, Ornate said, pride swelling even more as little blue blood's actions. She knew from personal experience how much the colt disliked books, often tossing them aside whenever presented with them, opting to play with his toys instead. Yet here he was, offering to do something he hated, just to make his sister happy and let her catch her breath. At that moment, Ornate knew her son would grow up to be a fine stallion. Yes, they are precious, said Blue Blood the 16th, leaning to kiss his wife on the cheek. To his surprise, however, the mare pulled away. Don't think I'm not still mad at you. You fired one of our oldest maids without consulting me. 
Blueblood's face became stern. I'm not going to apologize for that. Daisy may have worked here for nearly six years, but that does not make her exempt from punishment. But she was so good with the little blue blood. She was his favorite nanny. Ornate argued back. I stand by my decision, blue blood said, jaw set. Ornate sighed and shook her head, gaze returning to her children. She was upset about losing such a valuable helper, sure, but she was more upset that her husband refused to tell her why he had fired Daisy Care. She knew already, of course. It was hard not to hear the whispers, but the fact that Blue Blood thought she couldn't handle the truth irked her. It wasn't like she wasn't upset about it, too. She had heard Daisy badmouthing her daughter, saying she was weird, unnatural, or anything other than the beautiful little angel she was. She'd be hard pressed not to fire her as well. She might even have slugged her, but that doesn't change the fact that her husband shouldn't have gone behind her back like she was a naive filly who needed sheltering. Besides, if they fired every worker who thought pure blood strange, they'd have to replace a third of the staff. Ornate's father always taught her that retaliation to insults was as good as proving those insults right to the attacker, and that it was always better to let those fools see for themselves how wrong they were. That's what Ornate was going to do. She sent them away now, those maids and butlers will leave thinking they were right about the youngest daughter of the Platinum Line. But if they stayed, it was only a matter of time before they fell in love with a precious little filly like she had. Watching Pureblood enthusiastically point at pictures from her books and indicate the words for her brother to try, she felt it wouldn't take long. That was Gilda's Sister, Chapter 5, Recollect, by Kinda Brony. So we are officially uh, five chapters into this really long story, and I am really happy that y'all seem to be enjoying this. Next week, I have something uh, special planned. It's a little bit more, um, I guess, ambitious in comparison to the work I've been doing for the past month. Wow, I've actually been able to keep up a schedule for a month. Yay, go me! Okay, but yeah, um, so tune in next week for- I I'm very pleased with how that story has turned out. Um, I've actually been pretty good this week and been able to record, um, several stories in- in advance, uh, cause, uh, the rest of the month's gonna be pretty busy for me. Um, one of my nieces is turning one, so I'm gonna go be going to her birthday party. And then I have, uh, a conference I'm going to, so... Next Monday, we'll be having our one-shot story, which, again, I hope you'll all enjoy it. I put a lot of work into it, and I hope y'all enjoy it as much as I had fun working on it. And after that, we'll have uh, one more chapter of Gilda's Sister, and then I'll be taking a break from Gilda's Sister for October, because I think I'm going to try my hand at Month of Macabre and be doing weekly readings of uh, some more scary stories and maybe some creepypastas if I find some good ones. Um, if you have a particular creepypasta that's not ungodly long that you would like to hear me attempt to read, uh, please uh, feel free to tweet it at me uh, over on my Twitter. And I think I've been rambling enough, so yes. Uh, thank you all for listening. I the support is mind-blowing. I'm having a ton of fun with this. Y'all guys are amazing. And yeah. So thank you all for listening. I hope to continue this for this foreseeable future. Oh, and um, to plug my stuff again. Uh, if you would like to hear these readings a day in advance, you can pledge me on my Patreon. Uh, links below for that. And thank you again. Um... I hope everyone has a lovely week and have a wonderful time, guys. Bye!